All right, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Winter Webinar Series, Building an Open Textbook Publishing Program. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I am a Managing Director with the Open Textbook Network, and this is the second of three webinars we are offering our community and the Library Publishing Coalition community as part of a webinar exchange. Our two organizations became strategic affiliates in the fall, and this is the kickoff of many upcoming collaborations. I'd like to thank Melanie Schlosser and Allie Laird for their collaboration on the series. And if you have any questions about the webinars we're offering this winter, please get in touch with me. As I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, this series is recorded and will be shared. So the Open Textbook Network offers a variety of publishing resources, both for our members and the higher education community at large. One of the ways that we do this is through partnerships. I mentioned the Library Publishing Coalition, and the latest, which we just announced on social media yesterday, is with the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation. But here on this slide, you can see other resources that we offer and where you can find them. So uh, speaking of the Library Publishing Coalition, you're invited to join us at the forum, and uh, that will be held in Vancouver this year. And on May 8th, we are holding a pre-conference on publishing OERs. Um, we hope that you will consider joining us for that hands-on workshop in the morning and panel presentations in the afternoon. So now without further ado, I would like to introduce our featured guest. Kevin Hawkins is Assistant Dean for Scholarly Communication for the University of North Texas Libraries. He founded the library publishing program there and directs services to help researchers understand and adapt to changes in how researchers communicate with one another. Prior to joining UNT in 2014, he was Director of Publishing Operations for Michigan Publishing, the hub of scholarly publishing at the University of Michigan Library, which includes the University of Michigan Press and other brands and services. Kevin has also worked as Visiting Metadata Manager for the Digital Humanities Observatory, a project of the Royal Irish Academy. He served on advisory boards for Project Muse, the Open Access Publishing Cooperative Study, and Editoria. He served as the first president of the board of the Library Publishing Coalition and has contributed to major standards for digital publishing. You can learn more about Kevin at ultraslavonic.info. So I'm going to hand things over to Kevin. And for now, um, if you will please uh, stay muted for the presentation, we have allowed time for questions at the end. However, if there's anything urgent, I will be watching the chat. And uh, now over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Karen. Um, it's good to be here. I uh, look forward to, uh, to uh, talking with all of you and, um, and should have plenty of time to answer some questions at the end here. So again, the topic for today is how should you publish? First, I just want to briefly review um, what we heard last time in John Warren's presentation on should you publish, right? So in brief, uh, John talked about identifying campus stakeholders in publishing, um, those on campus who have a particular interest in um, publishing uh, in, in the, the role that, that, uh, that the, the campus, um, whether it's a library or another part of the campus might be taking on in, in setting up an institutional publishing operation, uh, and kind of creating a robust business plan um, uh, and kind of aligning with strategic plans and uh, for the institution uh, more generally and creating smart goals. Um, these are all kind of standard techniques uh, in, in leadership and management, right, um, in order to kind of um, uh, set up a project um, and, and, and thoughtfully um, and conduct it in a way that you can assess whether it's all worth it here. Of course, you'd also want to conduct a SWOT analysis, again, another standard technique here in deciding um, where your um, opportunities are, um, where there are sort of um, Threats, uh, for example, right? Other letters in spot here. Um, figuring out where where there, there's a real need um, to uh, in terms of offering a campus-based publishing program. But if you do decide you're going to offer campus publishing services, how exactly should you should you go about it? So today I want to focus on a few high-level decisions um, that you might be making in designing a publishing service. And I'm going to be saving kind of some of the details of implementation uh, for the the third webinar in this series um, uh, in the Kiho will go into uh, some of these things in, 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 in a good bit more depth here. 
So with starting up a new publishing service, you might want to uh, begin uh, quietly, um, kind of launching the service quietly here. Um, <clears throat> you, this kind of allows you to select uh, the number and type of, of your very first publishing projects, right? You may work with some sort of trusted partners here um, that you can use uh, to kind of pilot this service here. Uh, and then you have some publications to show, um, to show the kind of envisioned uh, end product here. Uh, and you know, you can also, during those early days, adjust the parameters of your service, right? What exactly you offer here, uh, and maybe even your branding. Uh, you might manage to get away with making some tweaks to some of these things uh, before the service becomes too well known. So as with so many other things, um, um, you know, starting uh, small and quietly uh, might be a good approach early on here. Um, you could also, uh, you, you might though, be prepared to launch the big splash and advertise it publicly and go looking for um, uh, authors and editors um, who you'd be working with here on the new publications, textbooks or otherwise. Uh, and so you might instead though, uh, kind of start small in the scope of the service offered here, right? Um, perhaps trying to, to address where you see the greatest demand uh, and then kind of adding on additional, um, what you might think of as features. Uh, uh, later here. So for example, you might just offer online hosting of um, textbooks or other publications uh, and, and preservation of that online version, that is a sort of trusted hosting here initially with, um, uh, and then perhaps expand later, right? So this is a good place to start because it has the build on the existing ex experience of a library and more generally of a not-for-profit institution like a university. And the other reason I think this is a good place to start is because the scholars that you'll be collaborating with sometimes think that this is really all they need, um, that they just need a place to put the content online, um, but that they'll be able to handle everything else, that they'll be able to sort of fully prepare the manuscript, um, get it into polished form, um, um, you know, that they don't need any extra support in this. Um, so, you know, fine, start there. Uh, and then, you know, you can kind of grow together, right? Because you may later be prepared to, to add on some additional services in terms of editing and graphic design and such. But um, if my experience is anything, uh, they will also find that they'll, they'll, they'll need some more support in these areas. Um, not every person, um, but, but they often need a little more support than they realize. <clears throat> so let's talk a little more about hosting content, right? This is this kind of um, uh, service here that's a good place to begin because everyone can agree that it's something needed. You need a place to put these publications. So, I mean, um, you know, there was a kind of time when libraries set up their own websites uh, for sharing digital content, right? Everything was run locally. Um, you know, you put up a web server or you, you set up, um, you know, some, some software, maybe something DSpace or whatever uh, as a place to park content, but but we've really um, all moved towards a model of, of shared infrastructure. I mean, whether it's in higher ed or elsewhere. Um, so so rather than everyone setting up their own website and having to maintain it and upgrade it and all of that, um, we can use some shared infrastructure here, whether it's provided by a vendor or just another institution, another peer institution that you might pay to develop and run this. Um, and 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 this infrastructure could be. Uh, I was just talking about a web server generally, but in fact, um, these days we sometimes uh, actually uh, distinguish on the back end between the place where we store content and the front end user interface. So uh, one or both of those could in fact be a hosted solution. But, um, you know, because we've moved towards this, this shared model here, you, you really shouldn't need to set up a new system in your own institution for hosting textbooks, right? If we're talking about textbook publishing and your institution already has uh, an institutional repository or other digital library system, you of course might look into using one of those, um, but uh, even if not, it's not the right product, um, there are plenty of options out there where you could be using another infrastructure um, rather than having to set something up. Um, so for example, um, many of you will have heard of Pressbooks software, this is open source software built on WordPress. Um, uh, so it is open source, just like WordPress is. Um, you know, the developers of Pressbooks offer a paid hosting service and the tech support to go with that. There's a discount for open textbook members. Um, 
So they're a sort of active participant in this community here. Lots of institutions use them. Um, so you might consider um, that arrangement. Of course, it is an outside commercial group, so it comes with the sort of risks that we're all familiar with um, in terms of um, paying commercial vendors for such things. But um, because it's open source software that you're using, you could, in fact, um, uh, later uh, decide to uh, host that software yourself locally. Um, you could you could set it up. There's a few proprietary themes that, that they 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 only offer for the host version, but um, most of it can all be set up and run locally. And so you always have that option. That, that way to kind of um, uh, back out of the commercial host decision. That certainly wasn't the case with, say, something like um, B Press when it was acquired by Elsevier. Um, there's also the Rebus community uh, and the Rebus Press, the place where um, publications out of the Rebus community uh, end up. Uh, it also uses the Pressbook software, but um, uh, it's essentially an outside hosted version, um, and so you don't have to. Um, either pay for hosting or run it locally. Um, you can kind of have um, your your um, your own faculty members who are creating textbooks um, or other authors here uh, contribute to that community, kind of direct them that way. But there are other groups, for example, OER Commons, long-standing uh, player in the OER community. They do have a, an interface for uh, editing content uh, and putting the other content uh, into that kind of digital library. There, uh, you can do textbooks within that system. Um, you know, maybe not quite as, as textbook centric as Pressbooks, but, but uh, it's certainly a viable solution here. And these all uh, have, you know, interfaces for editing the content directly, um, kind of right directly online. Uh, that's all built in. They have the ability to, to clone content, right, to make a copy of an existing open textbook and then, and then further edit it, which of course is one of the classic um, uh, advantages of open textbook, openly licensed textbooks. Uh, and then the, the online publishing is there directly, right? You're not editing in one place and then having to like export the results to view it in another place here. It's all within one system. So these, you know, all because they have those, those kind of main features there, they would all fit open textbooks uh, very well. Um, but you know, you want to keep in mind here that you're looking for a tool that um, can both publish directly to the web, as I was, as I was just discussing. Um, you want it there in a format that's easy to navigate and access on different devices, right? You don't just want a big PDF file. You want something that your users can navigate through. There's like a table of contents. You can go directly to a section, go directly to other sections. Um, that's kind of web native here. But you're going to also want to make sure that you have a tool that can create a, um, you know, a portable format, right? That can um, generate something like a PDF or ebook file uh, for offline use. Um, you know, so this is required for your book to be included in the Open Textbook Library. It's, it's a requirement that the OTN in maintaining the Open Textbook Library has has set. Um, but you know, in the world of open textbooks, I think it has a fair amount of merit, right? That you could take the content out of this um, one existing. Uh, system online so that if that system uh, is no longer available, someone else could still get to a copy, that they could read it on the device offline, they could print a copy in case of PDF. Um, so really that you know you're not locking people into sitting down on a web browser and and um, and only reading the textbook right there. Uh, this export capability is not available in OER comments. So probably one reason that our community has um, gravitated towards using using Pressbooks. Um, so again, you're going to be looking for, if you're looking to, for a hosting platform, you're going to probably want the integrated editing and publishing capability so that authors can make changes uh, instantly, right? They can fix that typo and they don't have to, uh, they're not waiting on you to do some sort of extra process of exporting from one tool, importing into another, updating the website, those kinds of things. Uh, and that it would have this kind of web native interface and can generate portable formats here. Um, but of course, I alluded to earlier, um, you know, using open source software uh, is something that is uh, an open source solution is really key here so to prevent vendor lock-in. You'll want an open source software that has a community of active developers and users. Um, there's lots of open source software out there that just got thrown online, but, um, uh, you know, maybe the person who created it is still using it, but others aren't, and so they're not sort of set up to to, um, to support it. Um, if you're going to ask questions, you may or may not be able to reach someone. Um, so really going with the, 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 the active established players is, is important here. Um, 
you know, you're going to want to make sure that um, your institution running this or someone else you're paying uh, can keep this, this, this system for hosting content uh, running <laughs> at nearly all times of day, right? If, if this is a system going to be, that's going to be used to host a textbook that's used in a class, um, you're going to have students who are going to uh, want to access at all times of day and aren't going to have, uh, you know, a lot of tolerance for being unavailable here. You certainly don't want to give a bad name to open textbooks because the website keeps going down around time of exams. Um, and, you know, you may also be interested in, in ensuring that the hosting platform can somehow integrate with your campus's learning management system. You, use, you know, Moodle or Canvas or Blackboard or whatever. Um, uh, a number of tools out there allow for uh, integration between the systems. So that's something like a textbook can sort of be embedded within a course in one of these systems. Um, you know, I, I, I'm always a little skeptical of how important that is. It, it feels to me a little silly. I mean, if there's a link that you can go to another website and people can read the book there, then I, I, I'm not sure it's terrible if they leave the, the course management system or the learning management system here. But, um, but, you know, I don't know. For some people, I think that's important. So that's something that you would want to consider as well. Okay, but, but let's think a little bit beyond hosting here, right? If you uh, later are prepared to grow your publishing services beyond simply providing hosting, or maybe, again, you know that from the beginning and you, and you want to be prepared to launch a fuller suite of services, you know, you might be thinking about offering, say, editing services. Um, editing, there's many <laughs> types of editing. Um, it can be things from varying from, from light proofreading to, to something like developmental editing, which is really sort of thinking about the the, the whole structure of the document, the narrative structure. Um, this isn't just like making minor adjustments to words. Uh, so there's all kinds, a whole spectrum of, of types of editing here. Maybe you want to be able to provide those services. It can be especially important for something like a textbook here um, that is um, you know, written in a way that's very different from, from just a, a journal article, right? So you know, not all um, scholars who, who publish um, academic writing are sort of um, actually um, prepared and qualified to, do, to, do, to write a textbook well um, and to think about how it's, it, it should be structured. You might offer assistance in clearing permissions for embedded content. There might be um, you know, kind of uh, diagrams, photos, um, other uh, excerpts from text, other things that need to be embedded in the work um, that are not openly licensed and you would need to get permission to include them. So you might need to kind of help the author or editor through that process. You might want to offer services for typesetting, or, or what can be called layout here, right? So taking uh, a document, um, say um, for something like from a Word document format, and getting it uh, in a nice, pretty format that's suitable for printing. Here. Uh, as I mentioned before, Pressbooks, for example, offers um, a nice way to do this. It does this in a kind of automated way, um, so you don't really need this. but there are certain kinds of texts that have all sorts of embedded content, and if there are ambitions to have little things like sidebars, um, you know, little kind of pull quotes, all these extra things, um, you know, you start to push the capabilities of what can be done automatically. And so you may need to bring in a professional who can just use software, usually Adobe InDesign, to, to do these, these kind of layouts in a, in a more manual way. Um, so you may need to do that. Um, those we'll get to a little bit later. This does complicate um, workflows for updating the content. You may want to have an index in the back of the book. Uh, it matters more for certain types of books than others. Um, you know, and in the age of, of open content that's available digitally, where you can do full text searching, it becomes a bit less important, but it has its place. Uh, a good index doesn't just simply tell you where a word appears on, on a certain page in a book, but tells you where a, a concept is addressed. And um, concepts, um, you know, uh, aren't always, uh, um, you know, uh, explained uh, with the same sets of words. And so a good index can essentially help you deal with synonyms. And finally, you might have cover designs for a print version of a book, uh, or even an online version with something that looks like a book cover. Those are pretty much always designed uh, by hand. Well, I mean, you can have a plain text cover on a simple templated design, but you often have a, a Kind of custom design with some graphic images and such and so you may need to have uh, someone who can create those as well so who though would do these things um, are you going to do this in-house or are you going to outsource here so there's kind of advantages and disadvantages to both approaches here um, on the left thinking about doing things in-house uh, a library or other part of an institution here uh, may already have staff who are qualified to do some of this work you may have 
people who in fact do some freelance editing or, or indexing on the side, um, or you know, even if they don't, I mean, you've got plenty of people in a library who are, who are well educated. Um, Many of them went through liberal arts education uh, and are good writers and such, and, and may actually be be suited to to doing um, work here involved in uh, back end of publishing, or perhaps your library is going through some reorganization, and you're kind of um, you know don't need as many people in a certain area, but you've got staff who are quite interested and willing to uh, to reskill. So you may be looking to have some staff kind of adapt and move into new areas here. There's also potential here for offering opportunities for student employment. Right, good ways for undergraduates or even graduate level students to get some experience um, working with publishing. Um, you know, can seem like a very sort of marketable skill, especially for sort of liberal arts or even humanities students specifically. Um, so it may be kind of politically uh, important for the library or whoever is running this publishing service to to offer um, some opportunities for students to be involved with these things. On the other hand, if you outsource, then you can. Um, Hire as needed, depending on the demand. When you launch a new publishing service, you don't really know how many people are going to come along and want these services, and so you don't want to be hiring staff um, preemptively, but you want to be prepared to move when you need to. So if you're working with um, freelancers and vendors, you can uh, hire as needed here. Um, and the people who do this are already you know, professionals who are experienced in this kind of work, so you're not trying to um, you know, teach people as you go along, <laughs> or you yourself are not learning it people who, who are experienced with editing and design and such things. I mean, I personally lean a bit towards the outsourcing end, but I certainly see the reasons why you might um, do some of this in-house. But in either case here, you're, 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 you're going to be managing people in some way or, 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 or contacts and vendors. Um, and you're probably going to be liaising uh, between these outside people, uh, I mean outside in the broadest sense, um, the editors, the designers. Uh, and your, your authors here. Um, of course, you can put people in touch directly, um, but in my experience, uh, it's good to have someone in the middle who really knows what they're doing to make sure everyone's talking about the same things here and communicating using the same language. Um, people who, who really get into sort of publishing work, and especially if they're like freelancers who often work for publishers, they get used to talking in publishing jargon, and the authors may not always be familiar with So I do want to put a plug in for the Open Textbook Network's publishing cooperative. Um, this new um, co-op is, is meant to offer support for institutions that want to publish open textbooks um, in kind of getting up and going with their new publishing operations here. Uh, but also there's a kind of way in here to leverage a shared vendor workflow for editing and design. So co-op is working with a vendor called Scribe um, and is trying to set up a kind of workflow that will scale well for all people all involved. So Scribe would have a, a more predictable flow of content all, and working through a single system on a, of a similar type and um, so it kind of works well for them. They can work more efficiently, uh, maybe offer a slightly better rate than if everyone was working with them independently um, and get a single flow here and kind of get everyone trained on it. So I think there's a lot of promise there. Um, if, if your institution joins the you know, Open Textbook Network's publishing cooperative, um, you could essentially use that as your, as your outsourced um, um, production here. Um, so production including editing and design and such, that whole part of the publishing operation. Um, but you know, it's a member-owned thing here, so, so you're not just paying a vendor to do this work. So that may uh, kind of uh, sit better with you philosophically. A few other things to think about, though. Um, you'll want to think about the question of who actually owns the copyright uh, in these uh, open textbooks that are being created um, and, and who, who's entitled to choose how to license it. Right, so as, as I wrote there on the slide, um, you know, in the open movement, we like to let our authors keep their copyright. We think that's sort of philosophically the right thing. But um, you'll want to do a little investigating here about whether at your institution, uh, authors of open textbooks would really own their copyright. If you're providing stipends to, say, faculty members to incentivize their creation of open textbooks, um, the institution might uh, consider that it owns the copyright because that's a work for hire here. This is something outside of, of the, uh, or in addition to the scope of a faculty member's regular employment, um, where they're simply supposed to be doing their own personal research here. Uh, and so the institution may own the copyright, and then the tech transfer office at your institution might uh, be the ones who were then are in charge of, of, um, of licensing the content, right? So you may have to have a discussion with them 
uh, about um, whether it really falls under their scope and then what sorts of um, open licensing they are uh, willing to, to engage in here for this university-owned content. Um, <clears throat> of course, do keep in mind that um, the open textbook community, uh, you know, believes in making textbooks not just free to read, but also openly licensed, and that having an open license in your textbook is a requirement for inclusion in the open textbook library, so you, you would want to do that if at all possible. Certainly being able to say that um, to your tech transfer office might help that conversation go a little more smoothly here. This is um, going to help the institution more generally here in getting this work discovered and used by others. But again, uh, and this kind of ties back to something John said in our first webinar here, think about how your open textbook publishing fits in with other um, campus-based publishing that might be going on here. Uh, maybe you already have some library publishing going on um, for some of the journals or, or uh, monographs and sort of scholarly works that aren't textbooks. Um, you know, maybe your new textbook operation can be aligned with that in some way, that you could use the same staff members or vendors for things like editing and design. Um, on the other hand, I think it, uh, I think there's something you said for actually keeping the branding of open textbooks and other campus based publishing separate. So maybe you have a brand for open textbooks and another one for the scholarly works that, that your say library is publishing. Um, that it just um, kind of keeps things a bit, a bit cleaner here that there's no kind of confusion over which thing is which. Um, this, that after all, that this isn't just some pot to catch all the other things here that come out of the university. But there's, there's some intentionality behind um, these programs. There may also be a university press on your campus or part of a, of a, of a say, statewide system or consortium of institutions here. Um, there might be some interest from the, even from the university press end in collaborating here. Um, sometimes presses are under a kind of certain political pressure to demonstrate that they can give back to and serve their own campus. Since university presses tend to function in this very outward facing way, um, attracting authors and readers um, from, from outside the institution, but they may be under a little pressure to demonstrate that they kind of give back to the community uh, and to the campus. And so doing that by supporting some open textbook uh, activities uh, might work very well on their end as well. And of course, the staff there have deep, deep experience with things like editing design, also marketing and distribution of the book supply chain, which we really haven't even talked about here, but they may be able, they may be able, to, be able to help with here. Um, certainly quite important as we talk a little bit more here about uh, distributing in some various formats. If you are going to do print distribution of textbooks, your open textbooks, not simply making them available online to read in a web native format, and available in downloadable formats like PDF and ebook. Um, you need to think about um, kind of different channels and ways of producing things in print. So broadly speaking, there are kind of two ways to go about this. The traditional way is that you print a bunch of copies in advance, do a print run or multiple print runs. But um, more recently, we have print on demand technology where you print copies as needed, right? An order comes in, and then you print a copy, then you ship it. The line actually actually isn't so so clear cut anymore. There's some some kind of blurring. There's short run printing um, where you just print a handful of copies. Um, so you know uh, it, this isn't such a this isn't a perfectly clear distinction. Here. But um, but basically um, you know in that old model you've got a bunch of copies that are in the distribution center ready to be shipped to stores and all of that. Um, so you're investing a bunch of money up front and hoping to recover it through sales. Now that seems like a generally risky thing to do. Why would anyone do that anymore? Why not all print on demand? Um, so basically two reasons. The first is that print on demand uh, usually costs more, the unit cost is higher. So it costs more per copy to print. Whereas when you do a whole bunch of copies, each one costs less. So when your individual cost is higher, your retail cost also has to be higher to cover things here. <clears throat> um, but the other kind of reason here is the way the book supply chain works. When you have bookstores, they, um, they kind of take copies uh, sort, of, sort of on consignment, and so they can always send back unsold copies. Right? That's how there's big displays at a, at a traditional bookstore of like, you know, bestsellers, right? They don't sell all those copies, they send back the unsold ones. Or they often, if they're paperbacks, tear off the cover, mail back the covers, and then pulp the rest of them. Um, bookstores and uh, textbook stores definitely need to do this because they, they stock lots of copies, but not all the students actually buy them, right? Or they order them from other places. 
Uh, and so they need to be able to send back their own unsold inventory. So this is kind of an expectation in the world of, 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 of campus bookstores, uh, which gets complicated if you are doing print on demand here, um, where they can't really stock the title and have it available for the students to buy. And if the students come to expect that, then it gets a bit trickier here. You know, maybe the students are perfectly happy to go to Amazon and order a print-on-demand copy, um, but, you know, if they decide in two weeks to drop the course, um, now there may not be a way to return a copy of the book. Um, so things can get a little complicated in terms of how you set things up here. Um, yeah, I think the third row there I basically said earlier here. <laughs> Another thing to think about is any, uh, and investigate, is whether you have any sort of conflict of interest policy with faculty members assigning their own textbooks and courses. Um, this is rarely an issue if they're assigning an open textbook and the students are just viewing a copy online for free. There's no real conflict of interest. But if the faculty member is earning royalties on sales, then there is an issue here, right? They're assigning their own book and then making some profit. So you, your campus may have a policy about this where the faculty member has to get approval for such things and kind of demonstrate that there isn't another equivalent book and that it's not outrageously priced and things like that. So you should, you should want to do that. Um, but this assumes that you are, in fact, um, uh, paying royalties to authors uh, for sales of print copies. Here, right? So it might seem like a little against the open movement, right? Open, we're giving things away for free because it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's freely available online, uh, and also, why would anyone be making money off of it? Well, I mean, you may be selling print copies because it's convenient and it's what people want, and they don't want to just have a giant PDF file that they have to print on their personal printer and then staple together, or put in a binder or whatever, and so having a convenient print format um, might be what the customer wants, and, um, uh, you know, if you're going to bother selling it, um, why not have the author earn, earn a little bit of it? But it does... Um, present some complications in terms of institutional policies here. So something, something to think about. Um, but you know, you could also have the money go somewhere else. You could have the money go uh, to the library, um, especially if it's kind of a token amount of money, uh, to the publishing operation more generally, maybe to some student group on campus um, that is related to that subject matter, right? The student group for students majoring in you know, whatever the topic is. Um, so there are certainly some other ways to work around conflict of interest policies. But the other thing we need to think about here is updating this textbook, right? One of the advantages of open textbooks is not only that others might choose to improve on the book um, by creating a derivative version, but maybe even the author would, be, would choose to continue tweaking that book online here. Um, so you want to have a conversation up front with the author about revisions. Um, and um, sometimes people call this a maintenance plan for the book here, right? So what's the plan here? How often will the author be revisiting this book? Um, to uh, update the content. Are they going to be doing this on their own? Are they going to be expecting that changes will go live immediately? Or do they want to kind of quietly tweak it behind scenes and then release a major update? Um, are they willing to commit to doing this, you know, once a semester after teaching it, um, but not while they're not teaching the course? Um, but what happens if they just get tired of it and want to go away? But now your institution is, has committed a bunch of resources into producing this book, and so do you have the right to commission someone else to revise the content at that point? Certainly, if the copyright belongs to the institution, the institution has every right to do that, but if the content, uh, the copyright stays with the author, or even if it doesn't, but you just want to have a good relationship with the author, you might want to have some upfront understanding here about what will happen if the author is no longer willing or able to uh, to update that book. But also think about all the formats here, right? It's easy to update that online version, especially if you're using press books. But now we've well, got um, derivative formats, PDFs and eBooks. Okay, those can be generated pretty quickly with press books, but now you've got a print version in circulation uh, in the whole book supply chain. And now you want to update that. Well, that's tricky. You're going to be trying to quietly slip in a, a change. Um, uh, you know, subtly behind the scenes to fix a few typos. Well, maybe you can do it. It actually gets very hard in the ebook supply chain, but um, for print books, you could possibly get your printer to do that. Um, but, you know, if you're making major changes, you really need to issue a new edition of the book. There's a new ISBN. If you have ISBNs, um, uh, you know, it, it needs some clear identifiers so people know which edition they're getting here. 
Um, so you'll want to have this as part of your, your plan as well here. Who gets to decide um, uh, whether they we're labeling this as a new edition here? Um, and again, you know, what, what are you doing about pushing the sales channels here? Um, but actually, in fact, this is, um, relates quite well to the topic of tomorrow's uh, OTN at Rebus Community Joint uh, Community Office Hours tomorrow. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to attend tomorrow's um, event as well. So I've thrown a lot of you here, but we do have plenty of time here for some, uh, some questions. So I, uh, I look forward to hearing from you. I've just, oops, yes, turned on my video here in case you're wondering what I look like. So I will um, um, exit the slideshow, um, but we can bring it back up if you want to go back and see any particular slides. Thank you, Kevin. It is nice to see you. And if anyone else wants to turn on their video for a little bit of the human connection, um, you are more than welcome. Uh, thank you again, Kevin. This is the time for you to ask Kevin some questions about uh, what he discussed today. As you think about your questions, which you're welcome to ask either by unmuting or typing them into chat, I will just mention the third and final webinar in our series, which is coming up on Thursday, March 14th. That will be with Inba Kehoe. She's Copyright Officer and Scholarly Communication Librarian at the University of Victoria Libraries. And she will continue what John and Kevin started by talking about implementing a publishing program. Today, Kevin mentioned perhaps starting small. Um, Imba will talk about evolving from a small or pilot model into um, something more robust, including what your intake or application process might look like, how you decide which projects to support, um, how your program could advance diversity, equity, and inclusion and how to figure out appropriate staffing, which Kevin also touched on today when thinking about what you may be able to do in-house or out of house. So are there questions for Kevin? Uh, if not, I will make up my own. But surely, all right then, Kevin. Um, you mentioned moving beyond hosting and some key services and thinking about what people can offer. Oh, and I see Kathy has a question. Kathy, I'll get right, right to your question in a second. Um, if you could offer, let's say, only one or two editorial and design services, what is your vote for kind of the most important priority? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think um, certainly, um, some level of basic editing service I think is important. Um, I've had many authors come along with various types of works and assure me that the manuscript is perfectly well polished, that they've been over it many times, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as you get someone else to look at it, they start discovering things, right? I mean, I, I understand that sort of, you know, I mean, not, nothing's perfect, right? That anyone will always find, find uh, things that they might change in future rounds of editing when you get a fresh set of eyes, but Having at least one outside person look at look at the work, I think, is really important. So, you might even re essentially require a basic, like like proofreading for any book, right? Um, so, I think you need to include at least that. Um, you know, with a textbook, uh, again, I think the structuring it well um, is important, and so it may be good to also have someone, especially with someone with kind of training and pedagogy and and textbook authoring and such to kind of look at its broader structure and just think about whether it, it's really balanced and has the things you would expect. Um, certainly more important for kind of lower level survey courses where people come to expect um, a kind of clear, well-rounded structure. Perhaps it has includes things like objectives and review questions and all those things. Perhaps, perhaps not. Um, so I, I think, so that's two different kinds of editing services there. Um, those are probably the key things because I think you know you could get away with sort of plain um, uh, cover designs that are just based on a you know kind of plain text format or something very simple that doesn't require an outside graphic designer. And if you're using something like Pressbooks, you um, may well be able to get away without any uh, fancy layout as well, but keeping the, the 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 content of the book fairly simple, a sort of fairly straightforward narrative. But yeah, I really think it's kind of those two types of editing. You want to offer. 
Thanks, Kevin. And Kathy wonders if you can talk a bit more about why you recommend separating the open textbook and scholarly publishing brands. Right, so I think, um, so my thinking here is that um, if you if you had a, one, say, campus publishing brand that was covering all sorts of publications, textbooks and not, then uh, prospective authors who come along and are investigating this as an appropriate um, channel for one or the other may start to grow a little skeptical because it seems like it just is a place where anything goes. Um, I think this is probably more important actually for the scholarly publishing end of things as opposed to the textbook end of things um, because you may have some authors who are a little sensitive here to the question of imprint um, and an authority. Um, so if there's some textbooks thrown in that may not quite feel right. Um, but, um, you know, there's, this can go for all sorts of things. You may have very different types of scholarly works that some seem more, um, more scholarly than others. So there can, could be other questions of brand here. Um, and it all is a bit related to the question of, of, of peer review here. Um, if these things have been through peer review, if that's prominently stated, uh, et cetera, which is in fact this kind of next question here. So maybe I should kind of, Go straight into that one, um, right? Up, um, Charles asking about the peer review process here. Do you really um, do, do you build this in prior to publication? I didn't talk about peer review at all. Uh, I think this is this question here about whether you want to have um, um, uh, want to want to be doing any sort of peer review of textbooks uh, if that's appropriate for um, for the authors and for the institution, and if so, uh, when in the process it happens. So. Um, I mean, briefly, I think there's this question, yeah, should there be peer review? Um, many authors are interested in it because uh, it's some, it lends credibility. Um, they, can, they feel that they can now include this book in their dossier for promotion and tenure. Um, so, um, um, you know, this may be important for them in their own professional development. Um, um, on the other hand, um, um, there's a certain approach here that, well, the institution is already putting its brand behind it. It's, um, um, especially if your textbook publishing program is geared just to people at your own institution, which it often is, um, you know, you might say, well, people are already employed, employed by the institution actively, so the institution has already put a certain, has already vouched for that person, so um, do we really need an extra peer review here? And then there's the additional complication of finding appropriate peer reviewers. Um, uh, University presses tend to focus in certain areas. They know who the experts are in that field. It's harder to do with something like textbooks that might cover any discipline that's taught at the university. But let's just say you are going to do peer review. Um, there, um, I mean, in the university press world, um, you tend to do a review on a, on a prospectus for a project. So the brief um, uh, kind of um, uh, summary or pitch for that project before the whole thing's even been written. And then when a final manuscript comes back, there's often a second round here where that uh, the full manuscript is also reviewed. Um, so you could do it at a couple points here. Um, you know, you may not feel that it's necessary to do both, um, but you know, generally um, have at least one of those. Um, you may ask the authors for suggestions of reviewers, but you, uh, in the world of peer review, you generally, you know, you need to have at least one person who was not hand chosen by the author. The Association of University Presses uh, actually has a, a document on the best practices for peer review um, that is uh, openly released for everybody. Um, and so I encourage you to take a look at that to kind of think through some of the questions here about peer review processes. But, um, but thanks for asking that, Sean. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and I invite any additional questions. I have one for you, which is about libraries and university presses. You mentioned the opportunity for them to collaborate, and I wonder if you can mention an example. Uh, right, a collaboration in this area. So, yeah. um, so well, we're um, launching a new publishing imprint here at the University of North Texas. We have a university press, um, a small one, but successful one. And um, it's kind of just what I said. They wanted to be sure that they're demonstrating value uh, back to the local campus, and so, um, we're going to be um, uh, co-publishing the libraries and the press. Um, so the arrangement here is that the press will do the, um, um, will conduct peer review and, um, and do the production and distribution of the print version. 
And then the libraries will handle um, the hosting of the online version. We're also doing the initial intake. So we're doing the initial kind of filtering of proposals and then sending them on to the press at that point, assuming they kind of meet all the requirements here. So we don't have any publications uh, out, uh, published yet. We don't even have any in the pipeline. We just announced it um, like last month. So um, I'll be interested, of course, to see how that, that works out. So that's our example here. Um, um, but I'm trying to think offhand of some others involving um, textbooks. Um, no other concrete cases actually are coming to mind right now. Okay. okay. My audio is weird. Is it not? You're fine now. You could cut out during your question. So I, I think I, I missed a word or two. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry. I don't sound very good. Kathy has a question in the chat that I will not read. <laughs> Um, right, so how does the press demonstrate its value to the university? Bringing in money, good reviews of products? Uh, well, so here, press, um, you mean university press then, right? I'll start answering that way, and if Kathy corrects me, I'll, I'll change course. Uh, I mean, at university presses, um, you know, there's a kind of rhetorical approach here that they all take in terms of um, justifying whatever support the institution gives to that press. Um, uh, so it tends to be a sort of brand prestige thing, um, right, that you're a serious university because you have a university press, um, and while they're, they're attracting authors from all over and, and selling publications largely externally, they often have at least some um, line of publications that aligns with campus strengths, or they do some, some a, a bit of kind of locally focused publishing here, more so for, um, say, public universities kind of doing local history and the local interest things. Um, so yeah, okay, Kathy said yes. Yeah, so she was interested in from the university press end. But I mean, really, um, though I've been straddling the university press world for a while, and in some ways, I suppose you, you want to get a, a more authoritative answer from, from someone in the Association of University Press Communities. I think the politics around presses and their own campuses and board of regions and things really vary from place to place. Uh, how closely are they scrutinized? Um, is there an expectation from the senior leadership of the institution that the press, you know, make money or make more money or lose less money? Um, I think some are just um, under more, more pressure than others for various reasons. Okay, I'm going to another shot. shot. Do you have any recommendations for online plan idea? For example, you mentioned uh, errata or you know correcting typos versus new additions. Do you have guidelines that you give your authors or use internally for uh, I missed a little of that last part here. It's about maintenance plans, like tips for exactly what to include. Can you say the last part again, though? You got, you got it. it. It's just the different types of maintenance, and if there are different guidelines, you know. Right. You know a typo or a new edition. Okay. Um, oh, got it. So, um, right, okay. So I think um, um, it, you know, it somewhat depends on the type of work you're talking about here. So I think textbooks are a bit different from other works of scholarship. Um, uh, I think, um, um, you know, so let me show that slide again. Um, uh, start my video and uh, share my screen just to refresh everyone's memory. Um, so I think now you get to see uh, my um, uh, the maintenance plans list. Um, you know, so I think some of these things are really important here because um, textbooks tend to be something that a faculty member wants to revisit, right? That they're teaching a course over and over and they want to make improvements each time. Works of scholarship, of course, don't get revised as often here. Uh, so I think, um, you know, this is, it's really key to, to sort of be thinking about um, how this will be maintained. Um, you know, I don't have some sort of checklist right offhand to offer. I mean, I think these are really the kinds of things you want to have in a discussion. Um, so, uh, and since we're just getting going on our open textbook publishing here, we haven't yet drawn up a kind of agreement about this. Um, but I imagine what we'll have here in the end is like a sort of standard form with some blanks. And so, um, you know, we'll kind of write in things here like, you know, the faculty member, you know, the author commits to revising the 
um, you know, revisiting the content every blank, right? Uh, and, you know, um, um, but that, you know, we will not reissue the book in print more often than, than blank. Certainly with the UNT Press, that's what we're talking about here with our new partnership here, that um, maybe the online version, the author could log in and, and, and edit all they want to, but that we're not going to do new print editions more often than once a year. Um, you know, the, the, the press doesn't have any interest in, in just all that extra headache of, 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 of updating files and such, and um, uh, it just doesn't seem like there'd be a demand among readers. So I don't know. I don't feel like I was able to really give a lot more specifics there. Um, but I hope that helps give a little more context. Yeah, thank you. I think, um, oh, and you muted, that helps. Um, you know, just thinking about the office hours tomorrow and this um, developing sort of guidelines broadly for our community in terms of um, keeping things consistent but flexible, balancing, I guess, those two um, priorities, consistency in that you wouldn't want to make changes in the middle of the quarter or semester and then people who are using the book may wonder, you know, what happened um, versus the flexibility of, well, I see this issue and I want to make it right as soon as I can. So um, uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow. I see I, some more question from Kathy in the chat about uh, suggestions for how to determine whether to print, um, print, print, print physical versions. Yeah, well, briefly, then, uh, it's a good point about um, uh, versions that kind of keep shifting on readers. I mean, I think it's something important to keep in mind. You can use a platform like Pressbooks and make um, changes right away. And fixing a typo seems like no big deal, but if an author is making more substantial revisions, um, that can be unnerving to the students when things keep changing and they're not sure what they've looked at. And so, you know, I, it, I think the, the faculty member, you should have a, a clear dis discussion with them up front about whether they really want to be moving, changing things as they're going during the semester. Um, or if they do that, that they would just tell the students that um, ahead of time that that could be happening, um, but they'll, they'll never add anything that, you know, is going to be on the exam or something along those lines. Um, I think those things are important to discuss. You could also have different kind of versions. So you could have a snapshot that's being used that semester, but then the faculty member keeps tweaking another version that they're working on. But anyway, to the, the question, the new question um, about any suggestions about uh, how to determine whether to print physical versions. Um, you know, I mean, there's, um, you get, I see little anecdotal um, statistics now and then about, you know, demand for print versus online versions, but, um, you know, there still seems to be demand among students for, for print versions, right, for any number of reasons. Um, some students are more comfortable in print, um, or at least in, in, in long form reading in print. Others want to be able to, you know, add, um, you know, annotate um, without fuss. Um, you're not trying to work with a PDF file and do annotations in there or something else like that. Um, or they want to ensure they have future access or whatever the case may be. So there's, I think there's enough demand out there that it, it, it you want to be able to allow students to print. Are you going to just give them a PDF file and tell them to print it themselves? Um, or are you going to, um, you know, get that print file, the PDF, you know, run off as like a campus print shop and spiral bound, or are you going to do something more professional, like a PDF version? Um, I think these are all things to, to mull. Um, certainly, if you, the campus print shop option only works for students who are, you know, right there on campus at your institution. If you've got distance ed students um, that may or may not, you know, the, camp, the print shop may or may not be suited to, to mail copies. And certainly, if you want this book to be adopted elsewhere, um, you're, you're not going to be able to you know, support them by just some local printing. So you may need to move into using um, you know, a more established um, print channel, whether it's you know, Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing um, or Ingram Spark or, um, or any other uh, number of kind of print services companies that, that do a bit of this um, on the side. Thanks, Kevin. And we are approaching the end of the hour, so I think this is a good opportunity to invite um, everyone who's been able to join us to thank you for your time and expertise. Kevin is a member of both the OTN and LPC communities, so you can um, continue to reach out to him. This video recording will be shared in the future. And as um, we both mentioned, we hope that we see you on uh, March 14th with Enba Kehoe for the final webinar in this series, or even sooner tomorrow for office hours as we continue to talk about um, maintenance plans and how to, how to think about those together. So 
thank you again, Kevin, and um, thanks to everyone who joined us and look forward to seeing you again soon. Farewell. Bye, everyone. Bye.